Okay. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for staying here. <laughs> um, all right, uh, this is a very exciting moment for me and a bit surreal because, you know, f first of all, never mind my gray hair, it's my first ever presentation at a conference. <laughs> I'm a late starter. Uh, and uh, besides, this is the first time I'm actually speaking to a living audience in about two years. <laughs> because <laughs> you can imagine, in the last two years, yeah, I've been uh, mostly uh, you know, involved in materials writing, and I, st I stopped teaching a while ago. I had been teaching a lot before that. I got a master's degree from Manchester University in teaching English as a second language. And, uh, but in the last two years, I've moved to materials writing, uh, working for, for a large publisher, uh, and as well uh, for some courses, online courses, writing grammar courses as well. And grammar, in particular, has been my pet subject for, for many, many years. Uh, and something that I've been consulting people about, um, including native speakers who've been asking me <laughs> grammar, about English grammar. Uh, so, as you can see, uh, grammar covered, grammar learned, does this make sense to you? When we cover something, we're supposed to have learned it, uh, our students are supposed to have learned it, does it really happen? Um, we'll, move to that. Okay, first of all, my general question to everybody, what, what's your first association with the word grammar when you hear grammar, you shout out? Well, I, mean, well, I just, I just boring, okay, some, 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 some kind of, all right. Uh, <laughs> oh, I thought somebody was, uh, grammar present, perfect. Uh, why? I have no idea. There are also so many exciting structures in English, but uh, uh, but, okay, a number of students were asked the same question, you see, uh, the most popular answers, yeah, boring, challenging, difficult, well, it's complicated, and some, some find it uh, interesting, but it's kind of less, less conspicuous, and that was just brain raping, <coughs> and ooh, something like that. Okay, so generally, not, not a very positive, not a very exciting picture. Um, why is that? Well, does it have to be that way? Okay. First of all, uh, maybe it means that we don't really need to learn grammar. Well, uh, you know, let's learn vocabulary, learn to speak, uh, improvise, and then grammar will take care of itself. Well, uh, you know, uh, some truisms, if you forgive me. Uh, I believe that despite what a very much respected Hugh Deller says that Lexus is more important than grammar, <laughs> I had a little discussion with him on that, but <laughs> of course he's very much a uh, respected uh, scholar, but I believe they're equally important. It's like bricks and concrete in building a house. Uh, you know, concrete is obviously Lexus, and grammar is what what uh, keeps it together. Uh, and uh, then, the question is: Do we learn grammar through through rules or through lots of examples? So, how how do we learn grammar? Do we really need to focus on forms? Maybe just you know, l listen a lot, read a lot, and it'll just take care of itself. Well. Uh, it appears that focus on forms is, is still important. So we, need, we do need to learn present perfect after all, but you know, the question is how we learn it. Uh, and uh, in my own mind, as the cognitive science tells us, uh, there are two types of learning, uh, rule-based learning and example-based learning, and they complement each other, they go together. So uh, we, and at the same time, we reproduce what, we, what we've heard before, kind of unconsciously, the examples, uh, chunks of language, but at the same time, uh, sometimes we we analyze, we form, uh, uh, make a sentence from from based on what we know about grammar. Okay, so this is this uh, go uh, oh to quote uh, this cognitive scientist Peter Skian, two systems coexist: the rule-based analytic on the one hand and the formulaic example-based on the other. It also appears that language users can move between these systems, do it quite naturally, and this goes for other skills as well, um, like. Oops, my wife and I, this, this is us now. <laughs> my wife and I used to take some, I was say used to, yeah, right, used to, we stopped about a few months ago, take some uh, tango classes. And uh, even though we didn't go to get too far in our skills, but we found it really helpful to, uh, to know, you know, to know the rules, you know, to do how to do it, uh, to kind of uh, have clear instructions how it works, and at the same time to, to imitate uh, to see uh, samples, to see examples of perfect dancing and try to, do, to uh, perform the same way. So it goes for other skills, not just language. And in fact, uh, okay, anyway. So uh, problems with teaching grammar. 
And this, is, uh, this relates to grammar covered, grammar, grammar learned. So even when a grammatical structure form has been covered in a course, right? We've, we've done it, we've covered it, we've dealt with it. Uh, what may happen, students may still not understand it properly, you know, very well. <laughs> uh, you know, practicing teachers, they don't understand it properly. They don't use it when we want them to use it in production. Okay, here's, use this. I'm not gonna say present perfect. Uh, <laughs> That's perfect continuous, okay, yeah, no, they, they, they'll use another, they, they, they'll probably uh, substitute it with all the little structure that they know, they're confident about. Why, 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 why the hell should we use this? If, uh, there's simple grammar when we can get along and feel confident. Uh, uh, or they use it incorrectly, basically, they failed to grasp the meaning, they failed to grasp the form. Okay, why? Why does that happen? In ideas, just in a random idea, why, why does this happen? Well, lack of practice, okay. They don't know the reason why they should use it. They, they, can, get, they can get away with much simpler language and they communicate. Why, why, why should they use it? Even though, you know, there must be a reason why they should use it. <laughs> they're, 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 uh, pardon? Context, exactly. They don't, they haven't seen it in, in context. All right, some very good points here. Um, now, uh, I'm going to actually look at this, at this issue from the point of view of uh, materials development, materials that we use, which seems to be in line with the general theme of this conference, as I understood it. <laughs> uh, and uh, the first a very telling quotation is from Mr. Scott Thornbury, uh, and it also shed some light on the reason why we don't learn all the grammar we have covered. Grammar is not just transmission of facts, it's a gaining of skill. What we teach, they don't automatically learn. I can teach you the subjunctive in Spanish, it's forms and rules of use, and I can do it with flair, humor, brilliance, and insight. But there's no guarantee that you're going to learn it. You may remember me, the circumstances of the lesson, and some facts about the subjunctive itself. But placed in a situation of real language use, can you access the subjunctive? Unlikely, okay? So, uh, And here we go, we uh, talk about materials, how grammar is frequently taught in course books. Now, there are different course books that are better course books, <laughs> worse course books. Uh, well, it depends on uh, what, how they meet your needs. But, uh, and the authors are not necessarily to blame for some deficiencies because you know, I know what uh, you know, restrictions the publishers impose on you, or the, the publishers believe what the learners need and they, they, they tell the author to do it. Only this way to do to do it to follow a very very strict, uh, very strict pattern. But anyway, uh, I'm going to show you some pages of a course book, and um, you're going to tell me. Can you guess what structure is going to be presented next? Maybe some of you are familiar with this course book. Don't spoil it, okay? Don't don't. <laughs> if you know the answer, just give it to yourself, right? If you don't know the course book, just try to to guess what what this uh, unit is leading towards, what grammar will be next. And now I thought I could enlarge it with, a, with this mouse. Yeah, if you, you can see, can I, can I have the mouse? Yeah, if you, you probably can't see where else. So I'm gonna show you some, these pages, uh, and it's not gonna work here. Okay, oh, sorry. On my computer, I was able to right click the mouse and make any, any part of this larger, I was able to move. But anyway, uh, if you can, read any of the text okay no it's hard to read oh how did you do that maybe it was the wrong mouse that i had okay so you kind of uh okay so this is this is a text in the unit the first text the unit is called a brighter future that's the name of the unit uh and you'll see what the text is about what structure would be taught next um that's first page kind of skim or scan whatever you somebody here somebody can you enlarge this as well please I, I, no I, I'm deliberately moving on uh, yeah the first the first text could enlarge that please uh, right click and make it bigger oh yeah oh good any clue with the general context what it's about used to and could well so, yeah, just say what you think. This, because this, these three pages, then, then there'll be a grammatical structure. 
that's supposed to follow this. Huh? So lots of lots of ideas. You passive crude. So there's no, as yet, there's no clear sense of what they're going to teach in terms of grammar in this unit, right? Uh, can you move on, please? Oh, sorry, I could do. It. <laughs> uh, and uh, recent inventions, how they've helped the world. <clears throat> okay, in the last page. So, so much with the input that, you know, all right, and there's some exercises on the, those texts. Um, so, anybody can guess? Nobody, can, nobody has named the structure yet. <laughs> it's not that simple. Speculating about the future. That's maybe the closest to... That's close. All right, all right, here's the answer. Uh, here's the answer, and I'm supposed to... Um, yeah, oh. Okay. Um, the second conditional. Second conditional, right. Nobody named the second conditional. Uh, and here's one sentence, the only sentence that... Uh, number one in the, in the second exercise, the only sentence that was somewhere in the text there. If you had a, uh, and this is... Uh, and I'm, there's kind of weird examples here. I didn't have much sure I'd chase it, but... Anyway, <coughs> but it's probably, I couldn't figure out what story it relates to, it's probably the pictures, but anyhow, anything that has preceded this particular page has no, doesn't seem to have any, provided any meaningful context for the introduction of the second conditional. So there's probably, is it, probably it's just that the author has to introduce every, uh, a grammatical structure in each unit, and so probably this, the, they has to have somehow introduce second conditional, so, so there are the texts, and there's the grammar, and they are not not connected, uh, they don't follow one from the other. And then there are, and then immediately there's a controlled practice, there's free practice, oh, not free, well, kind of semi, semi control. Yeah, well, I was 20, I would, and so how you're supposed to be motivated and be prepared to use this, this grammar in your communication. Uh, <clears throat> so, and then, uh, I've already asked this question, well, I, I should have clicked earlier, why the second condition, all right? Uh, why the second conditional? And then this leads us to more general points about how grammar is frequently, frequently taught in course books and uh, the problems that are uh, connected with that. Um, okay. So here's the way, uh, here's the, the main problems that I can see with the way grammar is taught and generally taught in course books. It's kind of imposed on the learner. We want you to learn it because, because you have to learn it, right? Not because it, you feel <laughs> that you really need it, but because you. It's grammar, we have to cover it. Uh, and there's, there's minimal exposure. So one or two or three or four examples of this grammar in a text, not necessarily uh, where it really, it, it, it's really essential. Some examples just because they have to be there. And then you, you don't, uh, you're supposed to use it yourself. You don't get the feel of this grammar. Too much chopping, maybe this doesn't go for this particular example, but sometimes the chopping, it's like, the present perfect, okay, okay, I'll use this example. Present perfect is used first, you know, to talk about the action at unspecified time in the past. Second, to talk about the result. Third, about to talk about experience. Basically, it's all about the same thing, yeah? It's all about by now, okay? It's all about, so there's one concept. So essential meaning. Uh, but they are taught as disconnected functions, and students are sometimes confused. Oh, I have to learn so much. This structure is so complex. There's so five different usages, so different. Uh, early spoon feeding of the rule. Uh, so in this case, well, in some in some course books, yeah, you, you do you know, ask leading questions, and you kind of uh, have to de to deduct to uh, to work out what the structure means. But usually, it's still, it still happens too early. So basically, they tell you they give you the rule. You don't have the time to think really to analyze how this uh, grammar is used. Not always engaging a personalized context. Uh, learners can't relate to the grammar. No emotional hooks, and that's an important point because there's a research that shows that it's important. Uh, it it, it uh, increases the chances of students memorizing something when they have some emotional connection to that. So if it's some context that it doesn't relate to them and they don't feel anything about, it's probably not going to be remembered. And, and even the grammar that was taught in this context is not going to be uh, remembered so well. Um, and minimal recycling is a very important point. Minimal recycling, so it's just, it was here in the unit, next time it's in the final test, uh, and that's it, and you've, you've learned it, okay? There'll be no other units on the same grammatical structure. Uh, so, 
how to help learners remember and use the grammar taught. And here's what I, I think, and I've used it in some materials that I've written, and uh, these concepts, the concepts of uh, how to, to introduce grammatical structures in a more meaningful way, in a kind of meaning-driven uh, way, as I say. So the first point, first general point, it should be clear to students why they need the grammar, what the communicative value is. It's kind of a general philosophical point. It should, be, it should make sense, yeah, why is it is taught here and now. Uh, then this meaning-driven approach. So you start with a context that shows what I call, what I call the grammar personality. <laughs> so what it's, it's kind of kind of get to know it. Uh, and uh, with a context that really shows it, it's essential meaning, not many distinct meanings. So for example, I'll have some examples for you here. Let's see, uh, and you will tell me what you think. The second conditional, what, what would be, that was what I would call a weak presentation, a weak input, what, what I showed you in terms of preparing to understand second conditional. What could be the strong input? Essential meaning, what's the essential meaning of the second conditional and what could the input be about? What, what's the essential meaning of the second conditional? Okay, that's the first word, yeah, unreal. Sometimes students can't relate to what's unreal. Okay, could, yeah, speculation, right? So second conditional is about, uh, okay, I'll, and what could input be about then? For example, what kind of text could be used to prepare students for a second conditional? What could it be about? Dreams, yeah, dreams. Everybody has dreams, emotional, personal. So about dreams. Uh, so it's imagining, dreaming, really. How could it be if, uh, what if, uh, and then I could, I would. Oh, wow, it could be so. So, uh, and the text could be about a dreamer. And here's where I think fiction works, some piece of fiction, some introducing a char character, a character the students can relate to. Uh, so somebody out of touch with reality, for example, somebody dreaming, if I could, I would. Oh, wow, if it only if, uh, life were different, I might, uh, things like that. Okay, the past perfect. Mm. The, se the second, con no, the second conditional is about, okay, it's about real, uh, it's about making some, uh, it's about ma making, what's it called, contingency plans for the future, right? If, if this happens, this happens, this is real, this is real, this is not about dreaming. Uh, the first conditional is about some certain future situation that you have in mind and you're making contingency plans. What if this happens, if this happens? All right, how I can prevent something that may happen in the future. Second conditional is really like up there in the clouds. So, uh, well, what we understand as hypothetical, yes, but students don't always relate to the word hypothetical. Okay, past perfect. Well, yeah, but memories could be past simple. Wait, I remember something finished. Yeah, and what could the input be about? Okay, so we got even earlier past, even before, even earlier, and the input could be about, uh, for example, as an example, a story of somebody is recalling something. Uh, they forgot, maybe a memory loss, just as a, as, a, as a random idea. Yeah, somebody is trying to remember what happened before then. So they did this and the, and the, oh, sorry. We are telling a story in the past about somebody trying to remember what happened even earlier past. That could be the strong context for uh, introducing past perfect models. May, might, could. Speak louder, please. Okay, anyway, uh, possibility, possibility guessing, guessing. Uh, what could this be? So something happens up and is happening, some unexplained events, a detective story, for example, something supernatural that we don't know the answer for. So this, this context would be kind of strong for students to grasp the second conditional. Oh, sorry, it's like models might, may, might, could something is happening that we ca don't have an explanation for. Um, oh, I clicked it earlier, okay, anyway. <laughs> uh, passive voice, 
All right, it's a bit trickier. Yeah, let's, let's focus on the on action hedging the. It's called hedging, hiding the doer. Yeah, hiding the doer, and uh, this could be a report about a disaster. So we don't know who did. Doesn't matter who did it. Uh, a crime happened, and we don't uh, we don't know again the who did it. So when we look for materials that we use with our students, it's a good idea to see how grammar is presented, whether grammar is presented in this kind of strong, uh, through strong input, which really gets across the essential meaning of this grammar, or whether it's just there because it has to be there. Uh, okay, we're going back there. And uh, the next point is grammar-rich input. It's so not just a few examples, not one or two examples. Uh, provide really saturate your text materials that you you may prepare these materials yourself right Te providing a lot of examples of the target grammar uh, so students really really get get the sense of it get the feel of it uh, then per as I said emotional hooks personalized and engaging input uh, and what happened now Oh, there we go. Uh, then, inductive learning, okay, discovery learning. That's what I said, you give the answer too early. Let the students work out, let students figure out what it is. Ask them leading questions, but, you know, don't throw them in at the deep end. Don't tell them, okay, here's the text, now you tell me what this means, right? Because they'll be absolutely disoriented and, and uh, they won't, won't tell you. So, ask leading questions by, uh, you know, uh, pointing, drawing attention to some features of that grammar that really, uh, so they can work out what it means. And that's called scaffolding, right? You know. uh, and then enhanced input. What is enhanced input? What do you think? Have you heard of the, this term? Well, lots of that, that relates to the third point, grammar-rich input, yeah? Uh, enhanced input, and this, yeah, sort of right. Thank you very much. That's that's kind of debatable because there's research b b that both proves that it's helpful and the research that proves that it's not helpful. <laughs> but I, I've used it and uh, it's uh, I found it uh, helpful actually. Oh, have a look at this uh, e example of enhanced input. This is from a text for adult learners that I've written. <laughs> uh, I have a question for you. What do you think the meaning of red and yellow is here? But it's also not only have to, but also need to. And, uh, so what, they're all they're all models of obligation. That's correct. But what's the difference between yellow and red here? What do you think? It's meaning based. Pardon me. No, it's not formed related. It's meaning related. So meaning related. So yellow. It's all about what. Say it again. And that's that's what color. Have to. Uh -huh. Okay. So you, you can always you can always sort of boil it down to to a very simple thing, right? Don't don't overcomplicate it because yellow is about oh, red is about no choice. It's all about no choice. That's simple. That's a simple idea. That's essential meaning of of models like. Have to, have got to, must. Oh, sorry, must. No, must, of course. Have to, have got to, need to, right? It's no choice. I've got, I, I've got to do it. I have to do it. The, the main idea is I have no choice but to do it. Uh, on the other hand, yellow here is, it's a good idea. I think it's a good idea, okay? So this should, must, I think it's a good idea. Must is strong. I think it's very, it's very important, maybe. I think it's a good idea. Uh, Red is all about having no choice. So we've got the essential meaning hi uh, highlighted here, the, the color coding used. And, but this could be probably used at, this, at the first stage, at the early stage of uh, presenting a structure because it will be irritating afterwards. You don't always need to use it. You know, only at the beginning to draw, to direct students' attention to this piece of grammar. Uh, and a couple more points. 
lots of opportunities to use uh, the grammar discussing what students care about. And this is again, they have to relate to it on a personal level. They, uh, okay, practice in context that require the grammar, which is really a bit, you know, uh, a bit hard because to, to think of a context that requires the grammar 100%, yes? So you can always replace it. But think of a context that is strong enough, that is, uh, you know, one in which this grammar will be naturally used. And written practice is a must, okay? Whether synchronous or asynchronous, because written practice, you have time to stop and think, and you have to really time to uh, analyze and to, to really, uh, there's, it increases the chance of you actually using, <laughs> using this grammar if you do it in, in, written, in writing first, and then it will come out in speaking probably more naturally. Okay, and the last point is one very short word, but it's a very important word, is recycle, yeah, recycle. Because uh, one lesson, one unit is never enough. Uh, and uh, a recycling that all doesn't only go for the, you know, practice, it goes for the input. Recycle the input as well. So, uh, don't introduce the structure in one single short presentation and then get them to use it. Introduce it again, all right. Uh, provide some more grammar-rich input in another, uh, another class. And uh, here are some quotes. Okay, a few apt quotes that kind of prove some of the points I have mentioned. Uh, on meaning driven teaching of grammar, teaching language must be in the service of meaning making derived bottom up from exposure to constructions and not driven top down by uh, a set of rules to follow. Okay, uh, again, we're talking about. <coughs> okay. On noticing, yes, it's about this inductive learning, and you know who's the father of the noticing hypothesis, Sh Mr. Schmidt, uh, and uh, he proposed that we only really learn things that we, we consciously, uh, consciously think about. We, we apply some effort noticing them, only then do we learn them. So he said, uh, evidence continues to accumulate that noticing has a strong impact on second and foreign language learning. And there's a, a fresh uh, paper that says, important of making noticing happen in the language classroom is crucial to the role of the language teacher so as to facilitate learning. Okay, and, uh, and talking about recycling. Research shows, I think it's very important, that a very rare, it's very rare for learners to be exposed to a new form and within the space of a single lesson to incorporate it into their spontaneous language production, which we sometimes expect them to do. Uh, in the same lesson, we've introduced it, and we expect them to incorporate it in, into their speech, which is just a myth. So we need to... Second conditional. If this were possible, yeah, life would be much easier, right, the second conditional. But unfortunately, it takes longer. So we talk about spaced learning, or spaced learning and distributed learning. Uh, you can't, even the, as you provide this rich input, you can't expect students to, to produce grammar just immediately, right? You're gonna do it again and again, and only after a number of lessons do, will they ha have, th there'll be a chance that they'll actually be using it spontaneously. Not today. Uh, don't get angry with them if they, if they don't uh, do it too quickly. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, and this leads us to the final, I find it very interesting, uh, concept that was uh, brought up by uh, Mr. R.A. Claus far, uh, far a long time ago, about in the 60s or somewhere. Uh, and uh, l the idea of grammar as fact versus grammar as choice. Uh, so what is grammar as fact? We very often think of grammar as, as fact. Yes, there's the rules that you have to learn. Uh, and to operate such 
such concepts as that's how it is, you must, you can't, this is right, this is wrong, this is an error, this is correct. Um, yes, you're right, no, you're wrong. So this is, yeah, grammar is, there's some of that in grammar. So for example, the past simple form is ED, that's a fact. Yes, and it's used about events at a single time in the past, that's a fact. But there's another grammar, is grammar is choice. And, oops. and uh, when uh, a lot of gra the grammar that we use is actually is our choice. It's not something that we must say in this particular context, a single structure that we must use in this particular context. It may depend on what we mean. Could be better this way, could be better that way, uh, could be clear or unclear. Uh, so we rephrase it because it's unclear. For example, I'm, I can say, I live, I live in Perm. I'm living in Perm. Uh, I have a choice, right? For example, I don't have a choice because I probably say I live in Perm, that's permanent, yes? But in other situation, I live in Brighton, I'm living in Brighton. Uh, both are correct. And uh, th it's up to the learner to choose uh, because they have this understanding of the, co of the permanence and understanding of uh, temporariness. So they understand this essential meaning, they'll, they'll make this choice. Uh, okay, okay, anyway. And uh, I think this uh, the idea that grammar is choice is a very important idea to get across to our students because it's kind of liberating, yeah? Choice is freedom. So grammar, learning grammar, it doesn't only help them answer, uh, you know, get grades or pass exams uh, or just uh, find a way to say it correctly. Yeah? They give, it gives them choice to express themselves better, to express themselves more accurately in, in, in the language. And they get the freedom, really, to speak uh, as precisely as they, as they want. And it's important, I think, to cultivate this attitude in the students that grammar is choice. It's not just right or wrong, it's not just fact. Okay, this is about all that I wanted to say today, and I've been uh, a bit nervous, so I may have, uh, I may have not formulated everything perfectly, but I, you have a couple of minutes to ask me any questions. Anything is unclear, you have doubts about uh, anything you think doesn't make sense, so please go ahead, yes. Uh, just one, uh, could you share some practical tips? You said, we need to have lots of input, we need to have lots of context. Where do I get this input, Where, especially on site, when well, a student has used uh, some construction not correctly right here, where somewhere at a different construction, which I need to teach him today, but here it is, the last one. And this on site, I need to deal with it. How do I do it? No, uh, you mean you, uh, how do you? How do I deal with uh, this personalized or lots of input on site? Okay, all like on the spot when you're teaching, right? Because well, yeah, I'm talking about planning, planning materials, basically, from the point of view of planning materials uh, and preparing materials that will help you achieve, achieve your goals. On the spot, well, uh, well you, of course, you, you can't, if, if somebody makes a mistake, you correct the mistake. So it's no, no question about that. You Exposed correction of mistakes that I go with firstly, for example. But okay, um, and... Uh, Okay, then another, maybe a different, a little bit different question. How do I get all this input? Uh, this, there's not enough input in the textbooks, okay? Um, there's no personalized input in the textbook because I have a different... That's a very good question. Yeah, of course. First of all, choose between books. You pick the book that provides more of this. I'm not saying that all the books are, uh, are, are bad. <laughs> okay, choose the books that are more uh, towards uh, provide more saturated, more ri richer input, uh, more meaningful input. Secondly, you can prepare these materials while you prepare materials for your lessons. You can write, you can write a text. It's just one text, which is kind of filled with with this target grammar. Maybe sometimes to the you know, as as much as it's natural. Maybe sometimes beyond that. So you're kind of playing with this structure. Yes, playing with the structure, uh, and the text can you can write the text. You, your colleagues can write. You you have to have this database of such texts uh, for your institution. Uh, you're gonna have students write, uh, the stronger students, more advanced students write some input. So you can just accumulate it, yes, uh, and use it over time.
Well, it's a, it's a good question. Yeah, I'm not very qualified to talk about young learners because I've been teaching. Uh, I've been teaching mostly. Yeah, well. Yeah, well, well Hugh Dell's books are, are, yeah, well, outcomes, obviously. Uh, I mean, uh, so there's uh, four books, I mean, students' books, not just for learning of but just the students' books, maybe they want to learn about what would you do in this book? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Well, I've, I've been mostly, well, I've been using my own materials lately. <laughs> It's uh, and uh, in fact, I've written a book that is yet to be published, and, and is not yet. It's not yet published. But basically, you, you you can analyze the book that you take from the point of view of whether it meets this criteria, how it meets this criteria, right? Because you you know, and then decide, make your decisions whether to use it or not. But sometimes it's not your decision. I understand you. Sometimes you're forced to use certain books, but at least think about it in this way.